Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all coming from all over the world. You are part of the Eden webinar on when education moves home, which is part of our online webinars of the Eden associations and Diana Andone, the vice president of Eden. We are still uh, waiting for another one or two minute, for minutes for everybody to join us and to be uh, live. You can say from where you are coming and my colleagues uh, will be able to, to show to you uh, from where you are coming and that uh, you, are, uh, you can also register um, in the link which my colleagues have listed so you can receive a badge for your participation in this webinar. I hope you can all see us. We are also broadcasting live on YouTube. So you can also see us uh, live on YouTube. That's very good that you can all hear us and see us coming from all over the world, from Europe, but also from uh, Bangkok even, that's very good and very nice. And from Latvia, from Serbia, from Sweden, from Romania, my colleagues, Portugal, Germany, Austria, Mexico, that's nice, Kenya, that's even nicer, Ireland, everybody's welcome, Athens, welcome to everybody. We are so happy that you are so interested about our webinars about the Eden webinars. You can all see the information about these webinars here. And uh, you will be able to, to join us and to register for the other and the future webinars. I'm Diana Andone. I'm coming from the Politecnica University of Timisoara in Romania where I'm the director of the Center of e-learning, a very busy person and center during these times. And I'm also Eden vice president in charge with uh, communication and communities. I hope you enjoy our initiative of these webinars and please allow me to start this webinar. First of all, by thanking Eden for uh, allowing us to do this and also for thanking my university. We are using our university connection for this uh, webinar so we can have as many as possible uh, joining us live. This uh, today's webinar is about when education moves home and the implications for students, academics, administrators and education leaders. It is my great pleasure to introduce the main speaker of today which is uh, Dr. Ebba Osial Nilsson coming from Sweden she is my colleague in the Eden Executive Committee for many years now, but she's also a member of the Executive Committee of another large organization working in e-learning, which is ICDE. And she has a very long-standing experience on quality assurance, especially for online and, and uh, distance education. We will start directly with uh, Eba, with uh, her saying you're welcome, and then we'll start with the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Diana, for your kind of uh, introduction. And thank you so much uh, to Eden to setting up this series of webinars in this very strange uh, period of time we all are living in for the moment. So it's a great honor for me to be part of this uh, webinar series and to share uh, some of my experiences and thoughts about the topic. And I thank you all for have come, have, uh, setting the time to be together with us uh, for this webinar and uh, being here together with us. And I hope you all are uh, safe and healthy and um, stay at home uh, wherever you are. And I believe that you all are very busy because we who are in this area, we really have a very, very busy moment now. And that is also one of the reasons why those webinars are so important so we can share our common experiences to move forward. So can I have uh, my first slide, uh, please, uh, Diana? Uh, second, next, next one, next. Next. 
Uh, she used to have the title, When Education Moves Home, and the implications for students, academics, and administrators, and educational leaders, because it will have an impact and the consequences and affect all of us. It's not just uh, for the teachers. It is for the leaders, for uh, quality assurance uh, agencies. It is for, for everyone how to deal with this situation. Uh, I will just go through some, uh, some uh, slides. Uh, we all see those uh, headings in the newspapers, in social media. Post-pandemic outlook for higher education is bleakest for the poorest. Uh, how COVID-19 could accelerate opportunities for higher education, time for universities to show their commitment to society. So higher education and education have really, really an important role. Uh, next one, please. Here are just some other ones. Uh, um, we are moving classrooms to the keyboard. Uh, people are working from home. Uh, we have the coronavirus COVID-19 at our um, keyboards and there are there's a lot of uh, um, posts and the news all the time. I have just chosen some of them and I'm sure you have seen a lot and seeing a lot uh, all over the places. Next one please. This is also a question, uh, what will happen with the universities when the education moves ho home? What will happen with staff? Next one, please. So we have some kind of new normal. Uh, the the COVID-19 creates a big transformation in lifestyle for all of us. And I'm sure all of us who are here and your colleagues and friends back home, you have changed a lot in your habits already for those weeks when we have been more, more or less isolated. So lifestyle has changed. Education has changed. And I am sure, and many of us, it will change even more. Business has changed. And everything in our daily life and societies has changed. And maybe, although it is so terrible in this terrible situation, we will learn some lessons from it. And that is, for example, for how the fourth industrial revolution and the fourth educational revolution can be a stronger part in building a new society because nothing will go back to normal. Uh, next one, please. I have a very short video from UNESCO. So instead of me saying those words, I would like UNESCO to, um, to say this to you. Maybe some of you have seen this uh, video before. There is a, from UNESCO, a global education coalition starting just some weeks ago. I will encourage you to have a look at their web pages. As of today, March 25, over 1.4 billion learners worldwide are affected by school closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly overnight, we have entered a radically new age of learning. Schooling on our planet has gone virtual, delivered over airwaves and broadband has just stopped. The starting point is not the same for all. The greatest danger is that children from marginalized backgrounds will lose out on their education, and we cannot let this happen. The scale of the challenge demands innovation, partnership, solidarity. We need to act urgently and work together as one. This is why UNESCO is launching the COVID-19 Global Education Coalition today. We have on board members of the UN family, civil society organization, media companies, IT partners. They have eagerly stepped forward to share their talent, tools and technology to tackle content and connectivity gaps. Together, we will help countries design and deploy innovative and context sensitive solutions that leave no one behind. Education cannot stop. It is a fundamental right. Let's be sure to keep it that way. Through this crisis and well beyond, and to draw as well the lessons of this crisis for the future of education. Thank you very much. So thank you. So um, please, if you have any comments or questions, you are welcome to um, post that in the chat. But there is also here in Zoom a question uh, and answer box where you also can put your questions and we will um, um, have a look at that uh, due throughout the presentations. So as was said from uh, um, the president, uh, the UNESCO, 
education can't stop. And uh, I think you have say, seen a lot of uh, headings in the newspapers. Now universities are closed, schools are closed. Schools can't close, education have to, to continue. So I will argue throughout this presentation that uh, education and learning has opened up, although the buildings are closed. And that is a big difference in the approach we all have to take. Education and learning will never stop, as was said by Junasco. Um, this article became more or less uh, uh, viral uh, during the last week. The difference between emergency remote teaching and online learning. Many of us have been in this area for many, many years, maybe decades, and we have struggled with the uh, getting online learning as mainstreamed. Now suddenly, just over one night, everyone had to do it. And there are difference how you do it if you have the time, if you have the capacity, if you have all the resources. And as you have to move this uh, square box uh, just over one night. There are differences in, in approaches, but nevertheless, it is not just a quick fix to make it. We still need to do it with quality, with uh, all the resources which are available and all the knowledge and science which are available so it can be sustainable because nothing will go back to normal. And that's a real chance to do something good from this terrible situation. If you haven't uh, come across this article, I will uh, encourage you to read it. In all my slides, I have put the links where I have the references. I don't have a reference list in the end, but the uh, uh, links are on the slides directly. Next, please. So who are involved? Of course, the learners, the teachers, the academics, the admins, the managers at all levels, and that includes also quality assurance agencies. <clears throat> and also the parents. Actually, uh, when the, this, this seminar was announced, there was a question uh, directly to me if I would uh, tackle the question of the parents as well, and I will. I will start with leadership. Leaders today have a very, very tough situation, how to tackle this situation for all the partners who are involved. And also how to lead uh, remotely, bringing everyone on board and leaving no one behind. And what applies for uh, the, labor, uh, the labor law? in the corona times. It's not just to put everything online, it's just not just to, to uh, transfer uh, educational uh, settings or whatever it is online, because there are different uh, aspects also when it comes to working environments, which maybe are not so, so much focused. I will tackle something about that in my presentation, how it, because it's very important. <clears throat> And also, of course, leaders need to be uh, uh, to get support. And as I said, leaders are at all levels, macro level, meso level, micro level. Next, please. So how to lead successful teams when everyone is remote? and how to get everyone on board, and how to get everyone motivated and being, still being part of the team. It is a really, really tough question. Uh, there is a lot of uh, um, support pages about how to deal with this uh, very, very tough situation. For example, this one from Corporate Learning Network, Leadership During Crisis. Next, please. And then for the administrators, it is important uh, to develop a straightforward institutional plan to see how everything fits together, to still have this, try to still have this holistic perspective. And to define a default model, so everyone is more or less uh, dealing on the same kind of direction. Uh, please stay. And what is really, really important 
for students so they can take control of their own learning when they are studying from home, when education have moved, has moved home. It is important to let students know what to expect and when to expect things. So, so everything needs to be transparent. And that is quite hard, especially when you have to deal with it, uh, to just change the, the, the way of teaching and learning and the curricula over one night. Maybe you notice that not everything is so transparent as you maybe have wished it should have been. And the don't overdo the technological, technological aspects. Uh, so. Next one. Yeah. And then for teachers, there are global calls for action on teachers. But I will say, although teachers have a crucial role for learners and for, teach and for the education, you can't put all the pressures for the teachers. And that is why I wanted to have this holistic approach with all the stakeholders involved because all of us need to be part in this uh, whole um, change, change we have. <clears throat> and teachers are the backbone of education, and it's not the buildings. And that is also, again, it is not about that schools are closed. Yes, they are, but education is open and maybe more open as, as any, uh, anyone, uh, uh, as any time. I have... Um, uh, some pulse in my presentation. And here's the first one. So while I'm talking a bit, you can maybe reflect on, have your institution transferred to distance online flexible education? Are there anything your students have gained from this transformation? So you can have a look at, uh, at the poll, please. So in this International Task Force on Teachers for Education 2030, it calls for all the governments, educational providers and funders and public and private uh, institutions to recognize the critical role that teachers play in the COVID-19 response and recovery. Thank you, Diana. Uh, especially for educators, maybe there are some uh, recommendations. Don't go wild and crazy. And again, uh, see what is, the, the, what is the way your institution have chosen and how does your way of doing this transformation fit in that model you have chosen? Because otherwise it will be very diff difficult for everyone. And also use and, use and support the tools which already are available, which already are used. Maybe you can, uh, uh, can mainstream them even more. Maybe you can uh, make it more fine tuning or whatever. And also use the analytics and try to be as responsible, res responsive as possible. Really listening to your students, really be present for your students, for your learners. And in case you don't have any institutional uh, guidance, um, talk to peers, talk to your colleagues, take help, and try to work together to get some kind of institutional guidance. There is a lot, a lot uh, already available from those uh, weeks, and I will show some of them uh, later on in the presentation. Coming to the students, Already research has shown that online learners say that they choose online education because it works best for them, just for me, just in time learning. They can develop critical thinking and problem solving. <clears throat> they can learn about time management, attention, put their attention to details, writing skills, teamwork and oral communication. This is what research has shown. How can that be used when you are transforming <coughs> the education where you are, in the institution you are in? 
Can that be mainstream? Can it be developed? Can it be sustainable? Next, please. In Sweden, we have a very, very interesting initiative. The text is in Swedish, uh, but uh, I will just uh, I choose, choose to show it because it is an initiative where authorities, uh, companies, um, even private sector have uh, come together and set up a page which is called School at Home. <clears throat> and here or you, uh, school, uh, school teachers, administrators, stakeholders can find more or less everything of every information. And there are even uh, digital uh, lessons which they can use. And they are mostly as OERs. It was an initiative, uh, actually, um, I mean, it came out from that, this crisis. And it was uh, led by the RISE Research Institute of Sweden. And they managed to brought together all those stakeholders and also the authorities who are dealing with education in Sweden. And it more or less came up uh, after just yes, some days. So if you bring people together, there can come something very, very good uh, out of it. And they choose to show this, although the text is in Swedish, because it has already, I've already got a lot of requests about it because people have seen it from abroad. So maybe that is something you can do in your countries. Uh, next, please. <coughs> so um, there is a saying, away is good, but home is best. Yes, home is best, but uh, it is maybe a bit different when you are working from home day after day, week after week. It's not just to sit in the sofa or stay in the bed and do some readings or doing some um, things on the, on the internet or posting some um, assignments uh, or whatever it is. You have to be also very, very disciplined. And that is also an issue which has not really been tackling so much, but uh, what I have seen at least, there is a lot of focus on that now, how you can make your studying at home more efficient more with quality, not just, you know, randomly. Okay, I do that now and then I can go back, go out and do that and that. But how can you really, um, can I go back to next, to the previous pl uh, page, please? Thank you. Uh, we well, of course, many of us, we already live in a time where it is possible for us to do most activities remotely. And that is very, very good. But again, it is, a bit different if you have to do it day after day, as I said, and, or week after week. <clears throat> and how do you need to, to arrange your working place at home? That is both for, for the workers, for teachers, for academics, for leaders, but also for the students. Next one, please. The pre next one. So this is, uh, again, an example from uh, School Everywhere, the Swedish initiative. They talk a lot about, uh, di about digital ergonomics. And here is a very nice film, and that, is in the, that one is in English. I will not play it here, but you can do it afterwards as, if you like. Uh, we see on the, on the left-hand side that um, quite often study working places are like that. A lot of things which are disturbing you because you're not used to work at home eight, maybe eight hours a day. And that makes really a difference. And you also need to have the pauses. You need to have a good, uh, uh, good chairs, good tables, uh, good light, uh, good ventilation and all these kind of things. So there's a lot of things to think about, both for the workers and for the learners, but also for the, for the managers, for the leaders, because uh, you need to have an environmental uh, environment which is uh, good and safe for you. Next one, please. <clears throat> so you need to be sure that you, of course, have internet. You have a computer or tablet, of course. And the workplace where you don't uh, disturb others and uh, also where others don't disturb you. You need to be rather disciplined. And you need, of course, to have all your logins uh, and... Uh, the tools you need, and of course, knowledge how to use it. And what kind of digital channels are available for you and what are required. 
And how can you manage your workplace so you can sit for a while without getting tired or without hurting yourself? Next one. Next one, please. So there are some strategies to succeed. Keep your regular routines. Write a to-do list. Avoid anything that distracts you. Schedule your breaks. Have video meetings with your colleagues and end the day in time. It is quite easy, as we all know, when we are working with the computers, suddenly one hour has gone and suddenly two hours. <clears throat> Try to manage your day because this can also last for a rather long time. Next one, please. Uh, we know from research from earlier on about e-learning and online learning, and uh, Diana mentioned the work I'm doing myself about quality, and uh, me and my colleagues, we, <coughs> we um, did some research uh, a while ago, and there are some, some features which are extremely important to keep online learners on, uh, going on and, and to, for them to be satisfied and to, to manage to do their online learnings. First of all, it is about presence. Presence with the academics, with the teacher. Presence with the, with the peers. Trust. The courses you are, are doing, the material you are, you are having and working with, can you trust it? It's about interaction. Flexibility in all means. Team, uh, space, path, material, media, etc. Accessibility. Motivation. It needs to be personal or personalized. Humor is a very important aspect. It is, uh, it is fun to learn. It is fun to study. And you have, don't have to forget that. Because that can improve and recall comprehension and satisfaction. And then, of course, the famous uh, kiss. Keep it simple and safe. Next one, please. So the parents, it is totally a new situation for the parents suddenly being the teacher with the children besides the work they are doing. And maybe they are not very used to online learning either or online uh, tools or digital tools. Here's a very nice page for parents um, about online resources for kids who are now learning at home. And I found it very, very useful. So maybe that is something you can look at. Because now the parents need to be the teachers as well. And to learn together with the children. Next one, please. Besides the stakeholders, the curricula as such is an important change agent. Here are two um, reports, one from um, the European Commission, Curriculum Guidelines 4.0, and one about advancing a new mindset about curriculum design. Uh, in Sweden, uh, our um, agency for higher, for higher education, they have um, started to, to think about now with the co corona, there need maybe to be changes in the curricula to, uh, so we can uh, see what maybe all not all the goals in the curricula can be achieved uh, in the way we have to when we have to change the way we are educating nowadays. So maybe the curricula also can help us uh, to for the change. And also, again, nothing will go back to so-called normal what we did yesterday or some weeks ago. So it's also a good way to start to think about the future, how we already, by this crisis, can make things going further on and, and keep the movement. Next one, please. Uh, next one, please, Diana. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, there are many stakeholders involved then we still have to keep the quality issues. And here's one of the models which is very often used, Badrul Khan. 
he has done uh, one for e-learning, um, for MOOCs, for OER, for this is the latest one about microlearning, and I choose this one because microlearning become a be even more important when education moves home, because you can't have those um, very huge uh, blocks or modules because that is very boring for the learners uh, managing their their homework from home. You need to to have uh, small pieces just in time, just for me. So that's why I choose this one for microlearning. But the features are the same. You need to have the pedagogical issues, of course, the technological, the interface design. How is the course design? How is the material design which you are offering? Uh, evaluations, assessments, management, resources, the support, ethical issues, and the overall institutional to achieve just-in-time and self-directed, self-paced, bite-sized, cost-effective learning. And this is a very good model because it uh, showed the, really the holistic perspective. So again, it's not just about the teachers having to change their way of teaching. It is the educational system as such. Uh, next, please. I will just uh, briefly go through some uh, some of the initiatives which have just come up the latest days, actually when I prepare this, pre this um, presentation. <coughs> uh, I have the links so you can have a look at it further on because all the, the NAT uh, global associations, organizations, have just in some, some days put, up a, lot, put up, up a lot of initiatives and collected a lot of resources how you can deal with this transformation when education moves home and also for all the stakeholders. So <clears throat> I believe that all of you have so much to do already, so why reinvent the wheel all the time? There's a lot of resources out there. Use that and see how that can fit in your context, in your country, in your institution. This is the one about uh, from Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, I will just show them for you so you can, can see them. Uh, next one, please. This uh, actually came out today. It is from Commonwealth of Learning, from uh, OER uh, University, from ICDE, and from UNESCO. And that is a support group for education during the COVID-19. And it's very much focused as, uh, on OER. And here really OER makes a huge, uh, can play a huge role <coughs> uh, as learning materials. You, again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Use what is already out there and in case uh, translate it, uh, adapt it, revise it, whatever. But don't overdo it because there is a lot of things already done out there. You, I'm sure you have enough to do. Um, this came out today and you can register so you can be in the community if you like. And next one, please. Uh, this was the one which um, is part of the, the video I showed you from the beginning, um, COVID-19, Educational Disruption and Response. Uh, UNESCO has again here put a lot of information for all stakeholders and a lot of resources and materials. Next one, please. And this is one of the pages within, uh, go back please. And this is one of the pages within uh, the previous one where you have distance learning solutions Next one, please. Um, <clears throat> the page from Aurora Institute, they talk very much about continuity of learning resources, because that is what we have to face more and more. <clears throat> to, um, uh, our school systems need to or orient towards anytime and anywhere learning. And that is in the same way, way to modernize our system to meet students and individuals' need. And it's a good time to reflect on that now when you have to change as well. Next one, please. And the other initiative from UNESCO again is about the futures of education. And that is an is initiative which is going behind or be joined the, the SDGs because it's heading for even 2050. But again, 
as you need to do a change and nothing will go back to normal again. We need to change for a future and for a future we want. And, that, and the futures of education where learning to become is crucial and where individuals have to take a larger responsibility because change is driven by people, not by laws, not by documents, not by strategies. It is driven by people. Next one, please. So uh, in literature and um, research, there are some predictions. Number one, blended learning will dramatically increase. Online education will be a strategic priority at every institution. Existing and potential OPM partnership will be rethought. I don't have the answer. I don't know if anyone has the answer, but uh, something will happen and something will, will change. And for sure, the answer is change will happen in one or another way. This was from uh, 1st of April. Uh, next, please. So uh, the message is, we are not going back to normal. Do the best as you can, and I'm sure you are doing all of you. Um, to stop the, uh, the coronavirus, we will need to radically change everything what we are doing. We need to change lifestyle, business, education, exercises, social patterns, shops, manage, shops, etc. And also about how we are living our lives and about healthcare. <clears throat> Many of us are saying, and I hear, hear it more or less daily, oh, it will be nice when we can go back to normal again, but there will not be that normal that we knew before. Uh, next one, please. This is my contact details. Um, next one, please. So uh, we have some time more, uh, but before we are going to the question and answers, um, I will leave you with this question. Uh, how do you think that the future of education and learning will be? And we are coming back to that question. But before we are doing that, uh, I will ask Diana, my colleague, uh, to say something about her experiences because she is right in the middle of everything as a manager and as a teacher. So please, Diana, can you share some of your advices? Uh, yes, thank you so much. But that was a very interesting uh, presentation. And if I can, uh, if I can say also that uh, um, I'm very, very curious how the reactions from the audience are going to be. Let me remind everybody that we have a poll which is open still, and we are leave, going to leave it open for another three, four minutes, and then I'll close it, and we can discuss the results out of it. Let me say something about our experience, maybe here in Romania, but also translatable to other uh, higher education, brick and mortar institutions. So institutions to which online learning was only a small part of what they were doing. They were based on in-campus, in-situ education with uh, very strong support from lab work, from project work, from seminars and uh, classes in big amphitheaters. For us, blended learning, for a lot of us, uh, was only a support. So you had, uh, like we had in the Polytechnica University in Timisoara in Romania, the virtual campus as mainly a support for our students and professors, where you will have some of the teaching materials, where you will be able to communicate with your students from time to time, but it will be only seen as a support for teaching, not the main method of teaching. And that was the biggest challenge when on 13th of March, we needed by day zero, let's make it like that, to move everything online. It was uh, the challenge also from the management perspective, from the technical perspective, from the support, the continuous support, which we need to give for the teachers and the students, but also from the quality assurance perspective, which is uh, something which I will try to, to catch very, very little to add extra to what uh, Eba was saying. So from the management perspective, usually the biggest challenge is how 
to make as a leader everybody to follow you, not to make it compulsory, but for people to willingness to will to go online, to will to teach online using video conferencing tool, you to use a lot of interaction, to use open and educational resources and to integrate them more vividly and more interactively in their courses to submit and even to pass and to give exams online when you have never done that before. All the time you go to the exams in situ and in campus, mainly because that's the legislation. That was the quality uh, agency assurance uh, main thing, that the exams need to be in campus, face-to-face -face exams all the time. So how you overcome that from the management perspective, then also technically, Internet is very, very stressed now, not the web. I'm speaking about the internet. Everybody's connection from home is struggling, is not always the best. You don't have everybody, not even from the staff, not to mention students, which will have good access to internet, which will have their own laptop. Quite a lot of them share computers and laptops at home. How you assure that everybody can has an, an equitable, and correct access to your to your studies, to your classes, to your online environment. When you cannot assure, when you know for sure that it's a digital divide between the different parts of the society. And even in as we are considered one of the best, if probably not one of the, the best technical university in Romania, and we have very, very good students. Our students need to pass an admission exam of math, quite a lot of them. So they are very good and quite technically oriented, but they still struggle. And how you give support, how you manage with 25,000 users constantly and continuously to give the support with a team, which was not, how to say, prepared to face this beside your normal teaching. I'm also a professor. I'm used to this online teaching, but even for me, sometimes it's tiring being six hours online running webinars because for us support also for the professors and also for the students meant that me and my staff we were every day in the last two weeks and a half online for one to three hours uh, giving advice giving training answering to questions to people which were professors from mainly from our university but not only and they were every day between 150 to 300 and something we reached sometimes the limit. We couldn't let anybody more in the room <laughs> to be able to, to listen and to ask questions uh, correctly and to see us. So that's one. And then the last one, but probably not the least, is how you will assure that the students which will graduate this year, your alumni, will have the same degree, the same competencies, the same certificate when for two, maybe even three months, they will study online. They will probably pass exams in a different format than the predecessors had, a different form than the law, at, this, at least at this moment, allows us to do it. How you will assure that from, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, the generation of 2020, the graduates of 2020, will be not seen as a second, second-hand students, second-hand engineers, or second-hand scientists, because they will say, mm, you passed your finals online. Your last months of education were much more lighter than to the others, even if that's not true. We all know that uh, the quality assurance in online education can be proven to be as good as in, in traditional higher education. But these are the questions which we are facing now. We are struggling to find good answers. We overpass, let's make the first steps of moving everything online improving everybody's digital competencies overnight and allowing everybody to join us online as much as possible, even using mobile phones, not necessarily a laptop and a computer. But now we need to face the reality that this is going to be longer and we need to make sure that the graduates of 2020 will be nothing to be ashamed of but to be proud that they've experienced a completely different education method and they, they will be, how to say, probably the most celebrated ones that they graduated in, in 2020. 
So that was my input, uh, more or less a, a tiny bit, uh, uh, probably uh, supplementing EBA's input with what's excellent and congratulations again to EBA. So let's, well, thank, uh, you. let's well, thank you so much, uh, Diana. Um, yes, that was really my, my point because uh, uh, we, we really will fail if we are just uh, moving the traditional teaching onto online because there, we all know as we are who are working in this area. But for others, maybe it's so easy to say, oh, you can just put your, your, um, your lecture online and that will, will help and that is good enough. But there are so many other aspects and features and issues which we really have to rethink. And that was the main purpose of uh, the topic of my presentation. What will happen when education moves home? And there is so much we have to rethink for all the stakeholders for what, what is really education about. And let us take this momentum and again as i have stressed so many times although it is a terrible and the worst crisis ever we need to make something good from it and as you were saying diana maybe those uh, students who are graduating now or maybe next year or whatever of course yes they have different kind of skills competencies attitudes values and that is uh, that is good it can be good uh, and as I said, there are so many resources already out there. Um, please have a look uh, uh, if you have the time and uh, try to get some kind of inspiration from, from there. And as you have seen, there are hashtags, we for Eden, we have the online together hashtag from ICD. We have um, a future uh, um, learning together and from UNESCO, they have the future of learning. So just follow those tags and you will really be in the large community. I have seen there is uh, some questions uh, here in the yes, please, Eba. That's why I wanted to point to you. Let's uh, let's pick one of the one of the questions, which is like, uh, what is the suggestion to use with the students without internet, and how you make uh, equitable uh, education? So maybe you can answer to that one, Eba, if you can. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that is a very, very good question and very interesting because, I mean, we take for granted that more or less everyone have internet nowadays, and that is not the case. We know that. And also with, uh, with physical distance, and it's, it's not easy to go to a library or to a cafe or to go to a, even to a neighbor or whatever. So it is uh, problematic. But uh, I don't have, the, of course, the solution for that, but uh, still I think we have to be very, very innovative and creative wherever we are in whatever kind um, corner of the world we are, we are to find solution and to make it, as I said, I had in one of my slides, don't uh, make it more complicated than it is. Make it simple, the KISS principle. principle. Um, I mean, um, books and papers and whatever are still good. Everything doesn't need to be on, on internet or online. Um, but I think we have to rethink what teaching and learning is about, and not just about this, you know, transforming uh, knowledge from one, one person to another. Um, I have seen many examples nowadays how creativity can really uh, flourishing. Uh, um, it's not an answer for your question, but it was um, some news from um, my country where they have a you know, the, those people who will become, um, what is it called in English, for bakeries, how they could uh, do the bakering uh, with via internet and to have a home, uh, homework. And uh, it, it was fantastic, uh, creat creative. So I'm sure you, uh, you who are asking this question can discuss with your peers in your country. Yeah. But the, 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 main, the main issue is, as they was stressed by UNESCO as well, the, the issue here is don't leave anyone behind. Yeah. Don't leave of, anyone yeah. behind. And that is the main message. And that is also a lot of articles about that for people who are, for example, with disabilities or some kind of uh, difficulties, uh, learning disabilities or whatever. There is a problem, there's a huge problems for them nowadays. And that was, was also why I wanted to, to say that it's not just about the the learning materials and the teaching as such, such, but also, I mean, the whole, the whole situation, so to say. But don't leave anyone behind. We can't afford that. 
Indeed, uh, that's one of the most, uh, most coming up uh, question, how you assure that students with disabilities, students who don't have access to latest technology can, have, uh, can still do it. And uh, another question, which I think is also a bit interesting, is students are spending too much time at their computer. So on the other side of the panel, we are also worrying about the students who don't have access to computers yeah. and to internet and who have disabilities and uh, very quickly in an um, emergency learning is difficult to assure that all the materials and everything what you do are available for people with disabilities and you need to rely on a lot on, on web tools for this. But there is also a question about what tasks and activities would you suggest to reduce the time spent at the computers? So yes, for the for the last issue, uh, that was also why I had some of the slides about. Um, we need to think about the working load for the students and for the learners, and also maybe to uh, stress for them. I mean, it's not just to sit in the sofa and do some uh, computing or searching on internet or doing some assignments here and there and whatever, but really to to um, be disciplined and and uh, um, to organize your working place as well. Maybe we can give some advice and some support for our students. A lot yes. of the universities have started the online psychological support and also yeah. they posted sport activities, which uh, every day they send to their students and ask them to do it online. I exactly. mean, at home, uh, with, where they don't need even to go online. It's going yeah, to yeah. be only a link uh, or some photos where they need to do some exercises. Yes, but also, also but also for for the, the teachers who are working at home nowadays, I mean, still we need to have the, the laws which regulate uh, the working load and the working places and the safety and this kind of things. And for example, this is a small video about uh, ergonomic. Uh, it's very useful. I mean, you need to now and then uh, stand up and uh, stretch out and uh, to make uh, breaks and whatever. So again, um, it is not just an issue for the teachers and for the academics going online. It is for the entire educational system. And maybe even there are maybe new stakeholders within the system, which we didn't have before, who are needed now. Yeah. So uh, other questions are about the quality assurance and the examination and the evaluation. So what's your input on this? Uh, do we have uh, any methods which can ensure that this move from the traditional face-to-face -to, -face to online examination can be, what to say, proven or can be reliable? Yes, for the online examinations, I will say um, again, I mean, the, the first issue I will, will uh, stress is about what is the point of evaluations and assessments? That is the first question we have to ask us ourselves. And of course, uh, I mean, many of the traditional exams and as, uh, assignments that we are having in both universities and schools today are quite uh, unnecessary, so to say, because it's just about facts and figures. And that is not what is needed in the, in the working life or in the society to be an active citizen. So we have to rethink uh, assignments and, uh, and, and exams. That is the, the first point. And then um, there is already so many evidence about digital exams, if you do it in the right way, that, that they are more safe for the, for the students, they are more safe for the teachers, they are more safe for the administrators and, I mean, for security reasons. So there are so many positive aspects. Um, and there's a lot of uh, resources and literature about that as well. But the first issue is we have to rethink um, ex exams and examination. And then it comes to the second point, which you also stressed, uh, Diana. Uh, I used to say the way uh, quality assurance agencies, for example, are uh, assessing uh, universities, that is what universities are delivering. And what universities are asking um, uh, faculties, uh, that is what faculties are delivering. And it goes down to the students. What teachers are saying, what would come for the exam, that is what students are I mean, focusing on. So there is this kind of bad change. And as long as we're not changing this system, for example, with the quality assurance agencies, they need to ask for different kind of questions to the universities. And then universities will deliver or schools will deliver. For example, as you were saying yourself, uh, Diana, about there are other kind of competences learners maybe have learned during this crisis. 
not at least for digital competences and uh, some of the issues I've had in one of my sh- my slides, the green, the green one with the problem-based uh, competences and uh, motivation and uh, collaboration and this kind of things. Those are really, really seldom measured or stressed in uh, quality by the quality assurance agencies. So uh, I think we... Yes, it, it's not an, an easy task. For example, if I can just say, because there are several questions about assignments and how you can simulate online uh, uh, activities based on the face-to-face one and on the traditional one, is like, uh, for example, what we are doing uh, uh, to us is like uh, we are uh, uh, giving the students either a multiple choice online exam or even a handwritten one, because if they need to draw things or to design things, and it's very difficult for them now to have access to specialized software from home. Our university cannot all deploy to everybody at home on their own personal computer special software, which we used to have in our lab. So we are going back to the roots sometimes on engineering drawing by, by hand, which is also a good skill probably to, to relearn from, for some of us. <clears throat> uh, we watched them via the video conference. So you do this, uh, how to say, this proctoring via uh, having the same time when you do a multiple choice of a test or any sort of examination by watching them via video conference and asking them from time to time to show what they are doing and how they are doing. So it's uh, there are ways where you can really, uh, how to say, support them. There is another question here, which is quite interesting, and maybe we can try to answer it to this one. It's coming that I think that video interaction between students and teachers is essential for motivation of students to deal with the topic of the course. How to motivate all educators in institution to apply some video platforms, such as Zoom or other, in their teaching activities. I have a feeling that there is a number of educators which just uploaded their teaching material in the LMS system. Yes. So, uh, it is a very good point. And uh, again, that is uh, very much about um, don't think that you can just uh, move the, your lessons online because that is not the case. You need to have it, uh, as you're, you're saying yourself, more interactive, uh, make it interesting, make it more personal, m- maybe small modules um, with uh, just uh, small pieces and maybe you can individualize it a, a bit. Um, of course, it is a large uh, question which we can discuss for more or less the, uh, another webinar again. Uh, but uh, um, so I, I will just uh, quick, shortly answer that. Uh, don't think you can just move your traditional course to an online course because that will be very boring, and you will not get your your students or your pupils uh, on board. Um, I will say, because I see that it is soon time to, to finish, uh, I will say, <clears throat> I know that many of you are maybe alone at your places, and if you feel alone, um, please join some kind of community. I know in many countries, uh, in my own countries, there's a lot of Facebook groups uh, and LinkedIn groups nowadays uh, with um, on this issue, so you can be in a community, you can learn from others. So take the opportunity, and again, um, my my point of of the of this presentation was more about to see uh, the opportunities which are required and needed due to this terrible situation, and there's a time for a lot of rethinking. Um, and there are a lot of communities, uh, not at least those with from the, the organizations. And there is already on Thursday coming up an event by this one by ICD and Commonwealth of Learning <coughs> and OER University and um, UNESCO and that uh, and about OER. And you can register there and you can be in the community. And there is a webinar on Thursday already at nine o'clock CET uh, in the morning. Um, you have the link uh, in the presentation. So we have um, yes, the uh, answers we, on some of the polls. Yes, uh, so if you will like to comment, so it's quite clear that the vast majority of the institutions have transferred to online and to flexible yes, distance education. Yeah, 
Uh, there, what is uh, most successful is that uh, they consider that the students have gained most digital competencies from this, which is uh, quite obvious in a way. Mm -hmm. But also, I quite like that they uh, enjoy the flexibility of this learning. And mm -hmm. they learn that you need to be more adjustable and more flexible which is probably something which also the professors have learned, not only, yes, the, yes. Not only the, the students, <laughs> if I make common this. And also at the third question, uh, how you do you think that the future will be affected by this crisis and by this time? Quite a lot of them point to the thing that online learning will increase. Let's hope that the quality of online learning will also increase and that we will be able to deliver quite a, a good quality-based uh, online education in the future. And blended learning will be the norm also for yeah, yeah. all types of education, maybe not only higher education, but also for, uh, let's say, pre-universities, the K-12 and the schools, which also have moved online. We haven't really touch that subject that much today. We focus more on the higher education experience, but I think the biggest change and the biggest challenge is for the kids age eight to 18, which have moved online quite a lot of them and which are struggling in homes where they don't have the same, they share the same computer with their parents and where it's very interesting for them to go online and they are not aware of any of the privacy or the problems which can be faced on going online and having everything online and sharing information and searching for information online because the school haven't taught them yet that. And it's a lot of uh, issues which are raised now. So, but the I positive is digital competencies. Yes, yes I, think, I think we can, uh, can learn, uh, I mean, already from this uh, webinar and from your answers for, for the poll number two, we can really learn a lot about that and how can we, uh, move on with that in in our back uh, our, with our backhead when we are planning for the future, because I really think, uh, as you, many of you have said, that students have really gained a lot and they have already taken the responsibility. So with that, um, I will say, uh, as I started, I will not say that schools and the universities uh, are closed. They are more open, hopefully, and they will become even more open uh, with uh, all our uh, experiences. And uh, let us um, move from here and move to a better world and better learning opportunities for all. And don't leave anyone behind. So with that, uh, I will thank you so much for your attention and for being with us uh, for this webinar. It has been a great pleasure to, to share some thoughts with you. And thanks again to Diana. And thanks again to uh, Eden for setting up this, this series of webinars. And thanks all for being part in this conversation. And try to be part in some of the communities which are setting up either in your country, your institution, globally, or whatever. Because uh, everyone is here for helping us out. And together we can be strong. And we need to do something good about it. So thank you very much. Indeed, thank you very much, Eba. I want to say that uh, we collected the majority of the questions from the chat and from the Q&A and also from the YouTube. We couldn't answer all of them now, but uh, we'll do the best together with uh, the Eden team and the Eden EC and the Eden fellow to answer to them and to post them online on the Eden website. So, Join us a bit later this week for more answered questions in writing uh, from us. I would like to stress again, collaborate, cooperate between us, between all of us, not only between teachers, but join companies, join uh, communities and try to work together that uh, uh, we overcome this time and we get the best experience. From it. So maybe just, just one point, last point, and that is... Uh... Take care, all of you. Stay safe and stay at home. Yeah, exactly. That was <laughs> what I wanted to say. Stay healthy. Stay at home. Take care of you. And let's see us uh, happy. Please remember that Eden has moved the conference, which was supposed to be in Timisoara. So I was supposed to welcome you in June in Timisoara. But it's going to be fully digital now. Please uh, go online in our uh, conference. 
page and submit papers. We still have the call open until 30 of April. We are welcoming also panelists and synergies from projects, from ideas. Let's hope that all of these experiences which we had uh, gained during this time will be able to be presented in the digital Eden conference in June. So please register and join us. I, we promise it's going to be a very, very interesting and interactive digital experience. All the best and thank you all. Be safe and healthy. <laughs>